Welcome to Category 5 Technology TV, episode number 426 for Tuesday, the 17th of November, 2015. Nice to see you. Tonight, we've got an exciting show planned for you. We're going to be teaching you how to take an IP address or a physical address and convert it to longitude and latitude. Plenty of applications for that. My name is Robbie. Uh, Braden is on camera. Hey, Braden. Hey. Hey. Uh, we've got Shelly here, and Jeff Weston is over filling in for Sasha. Jeff, Hello. how are you? I'm good, and you? Good, good. You got the teleprompter all figured out tonight? I do, it's yeah. Good. Figured out how to good. work those button things and make sure that the blue lights are working and the flux capacitor is all charged up. There we go. We're What's coming go. up, man? <laughs> okay, well, here's what's coming up in the Category 5.TV newsroom. Could we be on the verge of a working lightsaber? We're going to find out. A frightening marketing technology that uses inaudible sound waves in your home to paint a picture of your day-to-day -day device usage may already be tracking you, and there's really no way to opt out. A Google self-drive car has been pulled over by police in Mountain View, California for driving too slowly, and a Chinese smartphone manufacturer has developed a battery that will charge in nearly 50% in just five minutes. Police body cameras are shipping with a relentless virus pre-installed, and your Xbox One may suddenly gain a whole log of backward compatibility for Xbox 360 games. Stick around for the full details. They're coming up later in the show. This is Category 5 Technology TV. Starring Sasha Dermatis. Hillary Rumble. Krista Wells. Eric Kidd. And your host, Robbie Ferguson. This is Category 5 Technology TV. Welcome to the show. I'm Robbie Ferguson. And I'm Shelley DeSilva. How you been? Good. Welcome back. Oh, thanks. It's going to be back. This is exciting, right? Mm. It's going to be an amazing show. We've got a lot planned. we got a full hour for you. We're going to be doing some coding geekery, I mm. think. By, by, by the time it's all said and done, that's what they're going to call this episode, the coding geekery episode. Mm. Hey, do you enjoy Category 5 TV, our whole lineup of shows? Please consider supporting us on Patreon. We've got a promo going on right now. If you head on over to uh, patreon.com slash Category 5, all we ask for is just 25 cents per episode. We broadcast uh, an episode every single week. All you have to do is go to uh, patreon.com slash Category 5, and you can either put in 0 0.25 there or scroll down. Find out a little bit more about what it is we do. Mm -hmm. You can even just click right there, and that will take you there. But we've got these bad boys, these uh, teeny drones. We've got a couple of those to give away. We're going to be sending uh, one lucky viewer who supports us through Patreon. Mm -hmm. uh, one of those, we're going to be having, well, two of those, pardon me, a race pack so that you can actually race a friend. You Ooh. can charge one, fly one if you want. Um, that's all through patreon.com slash category five. We've had a pretty good boom uh, in the past uh, couple weeks as oh, we've been mentioning neat. Patreon. Mm -hmm. uh, people have been subscribing to that. And we really appreciate you doing that. Uh, that helps us offset the the expenses of running the studio. Mm -hmm. um, you you might have heard the furnace there running and, and keeping us warm on this cool yep. Canadian night. Um, it's going to be getting a lot colder and, and there are bills to pay and we appreciate you pitching in and, yep. and helping us with those. Uh, we're volunteers here at the show. If you're new here and, and aren't aware, um, all of us here are volunteers mm -hmm. and, uh, and we pay the bills uh, month to month to bring the shows to you. From Category 5 Technology TV to New Every Day and all the other broadcasts that we've been uh, working on for you. Find out more at patreon.com slash category5. Do we get right into it? What do you think? Well, uh, let me just... Category5.tv is a member of the Tech Podcast Network. If it's tech, it is here. And I've been watching the show, you know, sporadically. But it's been really good, guys. So if you have any um, check-in on our chat page here you know i didn't pay her to say that <laughs> no and the international association of internet broadcasters check us out at cat5.tv slash iaib 
I want to say hey to our chat room. We've got mm-hmm. a, a ton of people joining us there. If you're not in our chat room, you can do so through our website, category5.tv. Uh, we're actually hosted by Freenode as far as our chat room goes. So, okay. Jeff, you installed a, an app on your phone there that mm-hmm. lets you join us in the chat room from yes, your phone. I did. So you're actually talking to us on the Yes, I'm chatting with people too. right now. That's mm-hmm. cool. Yeah. Um, you can do the same. It's Live. irc.freenode.net, and uh, the chat room is... Category five. Nice and easy. Nice to see you, Sound Pro 69. Songbird, always a pleasure. Good guy, 98. Who else have we got? Sparkly. <laughs> Good to see you, my man. Um, looking at the chat room and thinking about, you know, we're, we're all from all over the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have viewers kind of everywhere at, yeah. at this point. Um, if you go to map.cat5.tv, Really cool to see where everybody is tuning in from. I'm going to do that now, and you can do the same. Map.cat5.tv. And as that loads, it actually throws a pin anywhere that we have viewers watching right. Category 5 TV. Uh, and this is over uh, the course of one month. So this is uh, the past 30 days. Yeah, so these are updated. some of them are watching live right now. Some of them were looking at the website this week. And you can see that we're pretty well represented all around the world. Well... How do we do that? We've been getting a lot of questions. People saying, I really love your Mm. viewer location map. It's obviously custom. It's not branded to anything other than the fact that it's a Google map. Uh, How do we do that? So tonight, we're going to be looking at geolocation technology using uh, IP addresses and physical addresses to create uh, geocoding, which is to convert Mm -hmm. seemingly random information like your IP address or uh, physical address into not really random, but um, into an actual physical longitude and latitude that you coordinates. Can, yeah. yeah, coordinates that you can put a pin on a map, <clears throat> which is how we actually do things on the viewer location map. So there are generally um, three different types of geocoding. Okay. And all different kinds of advantages. We're going to try to cover as much as we can tonight. Um, of course, it's a, a rather sophisticated topic, and, and uh, so we are going to get into some PHP coding. We're going to look at some open source. Uh, like Everything is freely available, so we're looking at PHP. Okay. I'm using a, uh, a text editor. You can use whatever you want. I'm mm-hmm. probably going to use Pluma or could use Gedit or could use you know, whatever text editor you like to use. Um, okay. But the technology can be used for so much. As you see, our map, so using uh, IP address mm-hmm. to... F- put a pin on a map. That's cool. Mm -hmm. Because normally from an IP address, you don't really know, okay, well, where is that person? Yeah. Um, You you, uh, can't. Just a bunch of numbers. Yeah, it's just kind of a, a, it seems like a random string of numbers, but it actually has a little bit of location information in it. We're going to look at how that works in just a couple minutes' time. Um, Then the second way to geocode or find longitude and latitude is to uh, have an actual physical address. Okay. So as opposed to an IP address, which is provided by someone visiting a website or uh, accessing something through a computer, um, you don't have that with, say, a real estate listing mm-hmm. where, yeah, you have the street address, but how do you automatically place a pin based on street address? Braden, okay. you were saying, interesting enough, that you can go to Google uh, Maps, Google Maps, and type yep. in an address, and it automatically finds the longitude, longitude and latitude, latitude and then yep. puts a pin for you. Well, what we're going to do is actually take it one step further. We're going to look under the hood of that process, find out how it is that uh, Google is converting that information, the textual information, oh. so street address, city, mm-hmm. province, state, whatever, and converts it to longitude and latitude to be able to place a pin on the map. Oh, neat. So that's the second way. And then, of course, the third thing that you can do with geo- geocoding is to actually convert longitude and latitude, if you already have it, into a right. physical street address. So where that comes in is, you know, if you've got a, uh, uh, say, your GPS logs, geo coordinates, mm-hmm. um, you want to convert them back into addresses, we can do that. Um, if you happen to have longitude and latitude, it's not really what we're focusing on tonight. We're looking at the uh, generating longitude and okay. latitude, but yep. just to know that there are options there um, to, to convert it back the other direction. So the two that we're going to focus on, I think, Shelley, are converting from an IP address okay. and converting from a physical address. Okay. So, why would we do that? Why would we do that? Why would we do that? Why would we use that technology? I think the most obvious reason to use geocoding would be perhaps um, for transactional purposes or logging purposes. So, I think about uh, anti-fraud. 
yes. for example, being able yes. to know, you know, if somebody goes to my e-commerce website, purchases okay. something and says, I'm from this address mm -hmm. and geocoding says, no, you're actually overseas somewhere. Okay. Then I, that's a bit of a red flag. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're doing something malicious, but mm -hmm. it's a red flag that says, maybe I got to look into this a little further. Okay. But then at the same time, if they say I'm from this address and then geocoding tells me based on their IP address that, yeah, that's exactly where they're located. Does that work with banks too and transfers? Is that what you're saying? Um, I'm talking more if I run my own e-commerce oh, okay. site. So if I'm running a website and I need to be able to mm -hmm. perform anti-fraud on behalf of my own website. Okay. So not so much. And they would probably, they would use those kinds of technologies for okay. sure. Um, definitely. But we're looking more at, from a programmatic standpoint of what we can do with it okay. ourselves. Yeah. Not necessarily what the CIA or whoever the NSA <laughs> yeah, can do with it, because right, yeah. what the NSA can do with an IP address. Yep. Yeah, uh, we're not going to go there tonight. So let's let's uh, kind of look at that end of it, converting from an IP address. Mm -hmm. um, there is a tool that we looked at back on episode number one hundred eleven. Okay. Nice uh, odd number. 111. One, Easy yep. to remember. Triple if you go back to episode 111 of Category 5 Technology TV, you'll find uh, that we spoke with, uh, with one of the team from MaxMind. And if you head over to MaxMind.com, gonna, you're going to see exactly what, uh, what we saw back then. They offer um, GOIP oh, neat. lookup. So, for example, if we enter Google's IP address, which is the one that we're going to use tonight just because it's nice and easy, uh, 173, oh, it's already, I already typed it in at one point. So there we go. You memorized that? <laughs> <laughs> My browser did. Yeah. Uh, so you'll see as I enter their IP address, that's Google based on, you know, we can get that IP address just by pinging google.com or whatever. Yeah. Um, Geolocation, geocoding tells us that they are in Mountain View, California. That's their postal code, approximately. Coordinates. The, yeah. the coordinates, longitude and latitude, and the company that runs their node, which is, in fact, them. So that's a great tool, but like Google, uh, using Google uh, Maps to convert from a, uh, mm -hmm. you know, an address to uh, a pin on a map, we can't really do anything with that because... Okay. From a programming standpoint, it's you're getting that information fed out to you in a format that you know it's not XML, it's not JSON, it's not um, comma separated values or anything like that. What we want to do is make it so that our programming can interact with that data in a very quick way, so that we okay. can have this stuff happening automatically in the back end. Um, so let can we get right into that? Yeah. Yeah. All right. And if you so, have any questions, I know, I'm mm -hmm. going to try to make this as sane as possible because I know that this is going to be a little complex in some ways. And so mm -hmm. I may, you know, I may have to jump back and forth. And you feel free, Shelly, to, to, to throw questions at me, you. Yeah, throw questions at me. Keep me level um, so that I don't get off track or anything with my, my Your lingo. sheer geekery. Yeah. <laughs> Rob, we do have one question from the chat room. Let's find it. Yeah. All right. Sparkly Balls is wondering about VPNs. How would that affect this? A VPN is a, is a connection from my computer to another computer, and then that computer makes the connection to the outside world. So if I'm connected from Canada to a VPN in the UK, and then I go to a website, then the website is going to see my IP address as the connecting computer that I'm connected to, not my own physical computer. So that's, that's where VPNs can be handy, and that's why mm -hmm. VPNs work for, um, uh, for example, people will use a VPN tunnel in order to gain access to Netflix United States versus mm. the local Netflix Canada. So we're not talking about the legality or anything about that, but that's why that works. So when they connect through the VPN, it tricks Netflix into thinking they're accessing it from the States when they're actually in Canada. Is it like a redirect kind of thing? It kind of is. Mm. Um, it's like, remember when, uh, b back before we had Magic Jacks? Yep. Like I'm talking, so let's go back to when, when we were kids. Uh, I was a kid a lot longer ago, <laughs> I think. But when, when I was a kid, we used to dial a phone number that was halfway between our city and the next city okay. to make a, a long distance call to the following city without having to pay long distance. So instead of dialing direct to this phone, 
we could dial at, uh, we could dial this phone number yeah and then it would give us a new dial tone and then we could dial the next phone number and it would jump us to the I next didn't, one i didn't even know that was a thing it was a thing <laughs> Because then we didn't have to pay long distance. Yep. Yep, Same thing as FidoNet or BBSing. Mm-hmm. We used to, before internet was in existence, the way that email worked is that my computer would dial to one computer, yep. send the email, then that computer would dial to the next computer, send the email forward, oh, okay. and it would keep going forward so that nobody was paying long distance. It was, right, yeah. it was going through the phone lines, but in, and that's why it took so long. So similarly, oh. a VPN becomes that jump point that yeah. I'm connecting to. So now states, yeah. when I go to the website, yeah, it could be the States, it could be anywhere in the yeah. world. Um, so VPNs would bypass what we're going to look at. Okay. Um, so it's, this is not, you know, geolocation uh, for, by IP address is not as accurate as, say, geo, geocoding based on a physical address. Because okay. when you have a physical address, it's specifically, you know, yeah, Barrie, right Ontario, there. Canada. Mm-hmm. Where when I'm in Barry, you're right, Sparkly. If I connect to a, a VPN or a proxy or something okay. in the states, it's not going to say Barry. It's going to say states. The states. Okay. So, yeah, you're going to get around Neat. that. Yeah. Um, so tonight, uh, well, let's let's get to it. We're going to do some code. So let's. I'm going to go into my terminal. Uh, feel free to do the same. <laughs> oh, maybe we'll start with Nano, and uh, that'll get us started. Uh, so what we need to do is just make sure that we have PHP installed. So you just type PHP dash dash version, and if it responds with a version, hey, you're good to go. Um, so let's go into temp and make a... Uh, I'm just using temp as a folder to, to create a file in, and let's touch a file called um, geo.php. So now if I run php geo.php, it executes that file. So if I edit it... There we go. Run it. Hello, world. See that? So now my PHP is basically that PHP file. I can execute it. Let's add a a line break there. See that? Hello, world. So I've echoed that out. So I'm executing that from the command line. I don't... So the advantage to that is I don't need to have an Apache server or something like that. And what Mm -hmm. we're doing is something that we could be logging it to a database or something along those lines. It doesn't have to happen in the browser. And in fact, we probably want it to run as a cron job because if we're connecting out to APIs, Mm -hmm. converting numbers and things like that, um, it may take a little, it may take a little time. It may cause Mm -hmm. a little delay on your website. So let's give it a go. All right. There are a couple of different services that, uh, that we're going to be looking at tonight. First of all, we know that we want to look at IP based uh, stuff. So MaxMind, we took a quick boo at, but um, if you want to use them for as a back end, they mm-hmm. do offer a free database, but the coding you need to figure out. Um, if, uh, if you want to use it for commercial purposes and for large, large scale numbers of lookups, then you mm-hmm. do need to pay for the service. They do offer other services like MinFraud at MaxMind.com, uh, which are definitely worthwhile if you're doing e-commerce transactions on a regular basis, doing a lot of e-commerce. MinFraud is going to help you to weed out bad credit card numbers, things like that. So they don't just do uh, geocoding. They do a lot more than that. So, mm-hmm. uh, so what we're going to do is uh, they do offer a free database, as I mentioned, um, but how do we access that database in a sane way so that we can use it within our program? That's where a program uh, that is open source uh, comes in handy. The program that we're looking at is free is from freegeoip.net. So using their website, and you can go to their website if you want, but we're just going to actually do the code tonight. Freegeoip.net. So I'm going to set up a server string, and we're going to call this http colon slash slash freegeoip.net. Just like that. So that's my server. So I've just mm. kind of set that up, and now what are we going to do with that? So with freegeoip.net, we've got uh, the structure that they provide is basically dollar sign server dot XML, or it could be JSON, or it could be um, uh, CSV for the output. So it looks like this: query equals server, which is freegeoip.net slash XML slash and then your IP address. So we're going to use Google as our IP address. Let's set it as a string just to make it make sense so that you can pull that from a database. You can pull that from wherever you want. We're using Google, so that is one 
73.194.123.63 is the one that we're using. So now if I go dollar sign IP, now let's echo that out, dollar sign query dot, and then a, a line break, just so that we can see what that looks like. So that's what the output actually looks like. So we set free no, uh, freegeoip.net slash XML slash Google's IP. Okay. So do you see how that's structured? So that is created. Query is created by server, which is assigned here. Slash XML, because that's what we're going to be working with, because I'm going to use simple XML to parse this. And you can do uh, JSON or CSV. And then we've got the IP address, and that generates what we saw there. So now I can actually pull data from that URL. If I actually go to that, let's say I copy that link address, bring it up in my browser. Mm -hmm. Watch what happens. It's taking a sec. See, it can take some time, I think, waiting for freegeoip.net. Uh. Come on, freegeoip.net. Mm, yeah, it's spelled right. Could be my browser, too. You know what? That's Firefox. Let's bring up Chrome. It'll come right up. Watch. <laughs> yeah. Freegeoip.net slash XML slash Google, right, is going to give me that. Same stuff that we saw in MaxMind, but notice that the response, because I've requested XML, is going to give me XML. So just to show you that we can do a JSON request, right? You can do CSV, but it's going to give you the CSV file in this case, I think. Yeah, it's downloaded it, so there it is. Um, but we want XML so that we can parse that. So you see it's, it's exactly the same information that we got on MaxMind because it comes from the same database, but it gives us a structure that we can work with. Okay, so let's go back into our file here and say, all right, now that we've got our query and we know that it does feed us with some information, let's actually create the, uh, the object that we're going to pull the uh, data into. So we're going to go free GeoIP. I'm going to call this one uh, just so that I have a, a sane name that makes sense to me. So I'm going to do an at symbol, which is just going to um, turn off any error messages just because we're not doing any error correction tonight you'll want to do something if this is going to be on a production server. We're going to use simple XML to load file and then bracket dollar sign query. Okay. So now if I print our dollar sign free geo IP, because we've remember we've assigned that now as an object with simple XML load file. Let's save that, run it, and you'll see that in our code we now have an object, simple XML element object that contains all this information. So we've got the IP address, we've got the country code, we've got the country name, region code, region name, California, the city, zip code, time zone, and longitude, latitude. How easy was that? So from your IP address, we've now ar already generated that easily longitude and latitude. So we've got what we need to, to do uh, pin on a map based on your IP address. So that's where map.cat5.tv comes in. Mm -hmm. We've now taken that IP address, converted it to longitude and latitude, and now we can place a pin on a map. So how accurate is that? Remember I was mentioning? Uh, oh, IP oh, address yeah. is a little bit it's inaccurate. Little, yeah, it's not exactly to the position that you're at. Any guesses, chat room or yourself, why that would be? Why would geolocation, geocoding on an IP address be inaccurate or off by a certain threshold. Uh, I had a, a viewer today uh, on Twitter. Let's see if I can bring up the message here. Did they answer or was that the question that they sent on Twitter? On, on Twitter? Mm. Uh, we actually had a discussion about, uh, oh, about this very topic. Okay. So I'm just going to log in here. And chat room, any ideas? And for you at home, I mean, send us an email. Mm-hmm. So it's uh, Writer's Horde. Writer's Horde, greetings. Uh, thanks for watching the show and for communicating with us on Twitter. Says uh, the geolocation, geocoding for them shows the pin about 99 miles north, northeast of where they actually physically are. 99 miles, that's pretty inaccurate. So 
IP address geolocation, so when we put pins on our map, mm -hmm. you don't have to worry about, you know, is that actually putting a pin on the top of my house? Is yeah. that a privacy concern? Is that, um, is that something that, you know, yeah. I really need to be worried about people mm -hmm. Coming to accessing my, my IP or, yeah. address? Should I always be using Tor and, and a VPN? Well, it's not that accurate. Writer's Horde says 99 miles away. And the reason for that is because geolocation based on IP address mm -hmm. is based on where your node is located. Okay. So if, you, if you've ever set up something like uh, um, uh, copper to your house and fiber to the node, you might, might have heard of that. So Bell Fibe, for example, um, they have fiber internet that comes to the node, and then you've got copper to your house. Oh, uh, okay. So the node is actually kind of like a, a box or a, a unit where it's a distribution node. Mm -hmm. The main internet comes into that node and then is distributed to all of the households or businesses that are on that node. That's why you may have heard that you know if there's a lot of people saturating a node, your okay. internet might get slow. Right. right? We have if a couple, you're on a shared uh, internet. We have a couple. Uh, yeah. Do we have some guesses I there? Yeah, we have some guesses. Nearest ISP address location. Not necessarily your internet service provider, but when they, where their cables all come mm -hmm. together at the node and then go out to the houses. Oh, that's where, that's it, where it is. Or the businesses, right? So yeah, you're, you're, you're pretty close there. Um, what do we have? Because the location of the server of the ISP might not be in the same city as you are. So kind of like the yeah, exactly. last one. Yeah, mm. yeah. So, so knowing that, we know, okay, IP geocoding is not so accurate that we really need to be concerned about a privacy mm -hmm. issue. Okay, so let's jump back to our code and let's see how accurate this really is. We know that we're looking at Google, so they're easy to look up and that's why I've used them. We've got a latitude mm -hmm. there and a longitude. So let's go to Google Maps and let's, uh, let's find out where they're located. Uh, oh, I could have just gone Maps, but okay, let's do it. We got another one. All oh, depends yeah? on the IP are registered with Aaron, A R I N. Aaron, Aaron, yeah. In North America. Yes, um, but the the node will still have geolocation information okay. as assigned to it. So you could be on, for example, you could have dynamic IP addresses with your ISP, and those can move around from node to node. Mm -hmm. um, but it would be accurate to the node that it is okay. assigned to right. at that time. So. Um, so let's let's look at this. I'm going to take the. Uh, so we had one one gentleman who who is saying that it's 99 miles away. That's unre unreal, and really shows how inaccurate it is. But let's look at Google. So three seven point whatever. This is from our own script that we just wrote in just a couple of minutes flat. Comma. So that's how we're going to search Google. Hit enter. And now we'll see that. It's placed the pin. San Jose. Yeah, let's see. Let's get in here a little bit. Oh. I think I lost my pin when I closed the window on the left there. Did it take it away? So it's kind of centering me. Let's check it again. Three, seven. Yeah, right. Right there. And now let's get directions. NASA Arm Fire Department. Nice. <laughs> and getting directions from Googleplex. Okay. There. Now I, now I see where we are. Okay. So the Google building is where you see it there on the left. Mm -hmm. So to get to their node, it would take you 13 minutes. 3.5 miles. And there, yeah, there it is. Okay, so you see that it's, it's not all that inaccurate. It's pointing us to approximately the right place, but it's not so accurate that I'm worried about a pin on my head yeah. when I connect to a website. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of either or? Of IP. And then specific addresses. So well, what would you use? Yeah, we're going to look at um, mm -hmm. using an actual address, and I'll, I'll show you, I mean, real quick. What's the difference, right? Um, here on Google, let's actually do a, a Google map search for Google's address versus what we just saw. Lyndon says his is spot on. 
Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Right on his nose. So there, when I do a search for their actual address, it takes me right there, right? Mm. So that's because it, it, they have the map data. Mm. So now it's not to the node; it's to the actual physical address. Okay. Much more accurate. You can get directions to that. And I'll show you how to do that programmatically as well. Oh, okay. The advantage to IP mm -hmm. uh, geocoding is simply the fact that I can get information without, like really quick. without a user having to provide any information to, right. to okay. me. Um, I, I could never pull uh, an actual physical address from your session mm -hmm. because where would I get that data from? It, your session really contains, your, your connection to my server will contain your IP address, your browser agent, mm -hmm. uh, what kind of browser you're using, what kind of computer you're using as far as operating systems go, that kind of information. Okay. But it's all very anonymous. It's all uh, you know, fa fairly safe, really. I think I get that when um, if my Apple ID is logged in somewhere else, it lets me know and it tells me mm -hmm. all, the, all the information, all that kind of stuff. So that sure. would be a random guess of where it could have been logged into. Yeah, that's possible. Mm -hmm. um, have you ever heard of a tracking cookie? Mm-mm. Okay, a tracking cookie. And Jeff, you were mentioning about um, uh, ability for tracking mm -hmm. from device to device. We're gonna we're gonna hear about that in the news in a few minutes. But oh. what a tra what tracking cookies do is mm -hmm. they they take your IP address and say, mm -hmm. okay, you're probably in Mountain View, California. Okay, that's what we find using the the reverse lookup on the IP. But then the tracking then takes it one step further and says, okay, now you've logged into YouTube mm -hmm. and you're using this account, and this account has the address of over here and so it makes the connection and okay. says oh okay now we know more about you so that's where if used in the wrong hands it can be potentially okay. a privacy concern um, but it's kind of the nature of advertising and, and the web at this point uh, but you can understand how mm -hmm. if I have your it, it's kind of like how the government was saying oh well we, we only keep a log of the phone calls that you make mm -hmm. but we don't keep a log of you know, how long you talk to or who cool. they are. Okay. Who they are is what they said, isn't it? Yeah. We, didn't, we don't keep a log of the names. Okay. Well, if I know the phone number and I have a reverse, yep. I can you find can out, out the name. Oh, yeah, totally. Easily. Mm. It's a cross-referencing. Like, we can do that, right? So if I have your IP address and I know that you log in as this, this, and this, mm -hmm. then I can look up that information based on the IP address. What we're doing is completely benign, though, and, uh, and looking at just placing a pin on a map. Now, one question I have, how does this work with mobile devices? Uh, would the nodes work the same way? It's actually, it's way different. And I'll, I can show you that because once we've developed the software, once we've written the code um, to look up by address, we could maybe run it against our own IP address here. Cool. Um, because we're on LTE, cellular internet. Interesting right. fact is because you're on um, cellular, it's, it's completely inaccurate to the point, <laughs> you know, that you could be in one city and it will put a pin on an, in another city. Oh. So it's, it's not very accurate at all when it comes to that. Hmm. So we'll, we'll look at that a little bit closer. Should we get into uh, address reversal? Actually, I think it's time, Jeff, that we throw it over to you and then we're going to look at how mm -hmm. to take a physical address and convert it into longitude and latitude. We're going to see how incredibly accurate that is mm -hmm. um, versus the IP um, geolocation, geocoding, which is not really necessarily all that accurate, but accurate enough that we can yeah. use it and, and feel confident that it gives us a good representation of someone's location for anti-fraud or for cases like our map. So right. we're going to throw over to the newsroom for the moment. And if you have any questions for us, get them into the chat room. Shelly's watching. Mm -hmm. And uh, we will uh, we'll field them uh, right after the news. So off to the Category 5 newsroom. Here's Jeff Weston. It's Tuesday, November 17th, 2015, and here are the stories we're covering this week. A breakthrough in photon technology is leading Star Wars fans to wonder if we could be on the verge of a real-life lightsaber. And that excites me. A frightening marketing technology that uses inaudible sound waves in your home to paint a picture of your day-to-day -day device usage may already be tracking you, and there's no way to opt out. A Google autonomous car was pulled over in California, and the reason is pretty hilarious. Imagine being able to charge your cell phone 50% in only five minutes. Uh, that would be nice. Mm -hmm. That's now possible thanks to a development by a Chinese smartphone manufacturer. And watch out, it's been found that a ton of police body cameras have been shipped out with a serious botnet virus lurking in the file system. And I hope you held on to your Xbox 360 games because an update to the Xbox One is rolling out this week that'll bring you a lot more backward compatibility to Microsoft's console. These mm -hmm. stories are coming right up. Don't go anywhere. 
you've got mad skills, now hone them. Learn new skills or improve your existing ones with online video tutorials and training from lynda.com through our special link at cat5.tv slash lynda. Learn software, technology, creative, and business skills that you can use today to help you achieve your professional goals. Join today and start learning. We'll give you this chance to try it absolutely free with unlimited access to all of the courses. Sign up now for free, cat5.tv slash linda. I'm Jeff Weston filling in for Sasha Dermatis, and here are the top stories from the Category5.tv newsroom. Your dream of becoming a Jedi Knight may not be as ridiculous as you thought. Yes! Scientists say that they've taken a step toward building objects out of photons in super-chilled gas. The discovery builds on previous research in which re researchers found a way to bind two photons together so that one would sit right atop the other, superimposed as they travel. This experimental test was considered a breakthrough in 2013 because no one had ever conducted anything by combining individual photons. It inspired some, uh, imagine, it inspired some to imagine that real-life lightsabers were just around the corner. Now, the National Institute of Standards and Technology and University of Maryland-based team have made a, a second breakthrough. Their study has revealed that by tweaking a few parameters of the binding process, theoretically, photons could travel side by side a specific distance from each other. But the development of a lightsaber is way off, if at all possible. Binding photons requires extreme conditions difficult to produce with a room full of lab equipment, let alone fit into a sword's handle. There are, however, plenty of other reasons to make molecular light from communication technology to high-definition imaging. Not only would this provide a new basis for creating computer technology, but it also could result in a sub substantial energy savings. For example, telecommunication and other data that currently travels as light through fiber optic, fiber optic cables has to be converted into electrons for processing. It's an inefficient step that wastes a great deal of electricity. In both the transport and processing of the data, it could be done with photons directly, and it could reduce these energy losses. Privacy advocates are warning federal authorities of a new threat that uses inaudible, high-frequency sounds to serendipitously track a person's online behavior across a range of devices, including phones, TVs, tablets, and computers. The ultrasonic pitches are embedded into TV commercials and are played when a user encounters an ad displayed on a computer browser. While the sound can't be heard by the human ear, nearby tablets and smartphones can detect it. Question is, do dogs? That I don't know. When they do, browser cookies can now pair a single user to multiple devices and keep track of what TV commercials the person sees, mm. how long the person watches the ads, and whether the person acts on the ads by doing a web search or buying a product. Kind of goes mm. along with what we were saying a little bit earlier about mm. how if we can make that connection between, hey, this is that user... Now we've got more information, we can, we can kind of put it all together. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. The technology, which is typically not disclosed and can't be opted out of, makes it possible for marketers to assemble a shockingly detailed snapshot of the person being tracked and is already being used by several companies. Officials said that companies with names including Silverpush, Drawbridge, and Flurry are working on ways to pair a given user to specific devices. Adobe is developing similar technologies, but Silverpush remains the industry leader using cross-device tracking technology. A Google self-drive car has been pulled over by police in Mountain View, California for driving too slowly. No action was taken, but it did raise questions about whether the cars in their current form are too cautious. In a post on Google+, the net giant joked, bet humans don't get pulled over for that too often. An incident report recently filed by the California Department of Motor Vehicles described a Google automated car as overcautious. The Mountain View Police Department said an officer noticed traffic backing up behind a slow-moving car in the eastbound lane. The officer stopped the car and made contact with the operators to learn more about how it was choosing speeds along certain roadways and to educate the operators about impeding traffic. <laughs> the car was traveling at 42 miles an hour in a 35 mile an hour zone. Would, you, would you think, Jeff, that because they're preparing for an autonomous road network that they, they've got to be cautious right you if think. there were more autonomous cars then they could flow a lot easier because they would know what the other one is going to do but it's mm -hmm. got to you got to be it's, it's like when you're driving down the highway and you see someone driving a little erratic you you kind of back off mm -hmm. it's entirely possible uh, what's going through my head is it's going to be great for insurance rates 
That's true enough. Because you know, I, I mean, so, yeah. you know, if you're driving a Google car, you're not breaking the speed limit. Yeah, <laughs> you, should, you should get a break on your insurance premiums for that. They're going to have a whole new ticketing system <laughs> for, for <laughs> an, the opposite of speeding. What do you yeah. call it? Anti-speeding. No, they do. It's, it, they do have charges impeding for that. Traffic. It's impeding traffic. I think it's okay. if you go, I don't know. Like, 13 below or 15 yeah, below? Yeah, something. It's like 25% below the speed limit or something. If it, I don't know. You, so if they just have an autonomous car reckless lane. Reckless driving. Autonomous car lane where they can all just drive like. <laughs> at the like, same pace. At, but, but they would go faster though, wouldn't they? Like, it, um, theoretically. My yeah. theory the would be the that airport. they would go faster. Uh, yeah. That thing. The conveyor thing. The conveyor thing. Yeah. I hear yeah. where you're going with that. <laughs> One right. lane strip. Yeah. That's right. I'm seeing it now. You got the regular traffic lane, you got the commuter <laughs> lane, you've got the autonomous car lane, <laughs> going for the bike lane. Yeah. <laughs> all, all 20 of them just going That's at the right. same pace. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Uh, I know I'm going to butcher this one, so I apologize ahead of time. Howie, the Chinese smartphone giant, has developed a battery that can charge to 48% in around five minutes. Fast charging technology works by including sturdier components, which can deal with a higher power input, according to Android Authority. Qualcomm has also been experimenting with fast charging, offering a 60% charge in five minutes. And Samsung's wow. Galaxy S6 handsets can get four hours of usage from 10 minutes charge. I don't buy that one. I've got the S6 Edge. It does not last four hours with a 10-minute charge. My Samsung does exactly the opposite of that. If I charge it for four hours, I get 10 <laughs> minutes of usage. Yeah. So we'll see. Anyway, Highway also developed a battery that can charge to nearly 70% in two minutes, but it's not big enough to power a smartphone for an extended period of time. One of the world's most prolific computer worms has been found infecting several police body cameras. According to a blog post published last week by security firm iPower, multiple police cams manufactured by Martell Electronics came pre-installed pre with the Win32 Win slash Configure uh, B2. When one such camera was attached to a computer in their lab, it immediately triggered the PC's antivirus program. When company researchers allowed the worm to infect the computer, the computer then attempted to spread the infection to other machines on the network. Configure took hold in late 2008, a few days after Microsoft issued an emergency patch for a Windows vulnerability that allows self-replicating exploits. Within a few months, Conflicker had enslaved as many as 15 million Windows PCs. Its sprawling botnet of infected machines eluded the vigorous takedown efforts of, of the Conflicker, Conficker Working Group, which was made up of Microsoft and more than a dozen partners in the security and domain registration industries. To this day, researchers aren't sure what the purpose of the malware was. Remarkably, Conficker's unknown operators were never observed using the worm to steal bank account credentials, passwords, or any other type of personal data from the PCs they infected. A report that police cameras are shipping with Configure B pre-installed is testament to the worm's relentlessness. It's also troubling because the cameras can be crucial in criminal trials. If, it, if an attorney can prove that a camera is infected with malware, it's plausible that the vulnerability could be grounds for the video it generated to be thrown out of court, or at least to create reasonable doubt in the mind of jurors. Infected cameras can also infect and badly bog down the networks of police forces, some of which still use outdated computers and ineffective security measures. iPower's president decided to take the story public due to the huge security implications of these cameras being shipped to government agencies and police departments all over the country. And wow. a big update for Microsoft's Xbox One is due to start downloading to consoles around the world on Thursday. It makes changes to the way users navigate around the console's dashboard and speeds up many common tasks such as checking what friends are doing. It also adds backwards compatibility to the console so that it can play many older Xbox 360 games. Initially, 104 older games, including Gears of War and Mirror's Edge, will be playable on the console. The update has already begun, but it's being staggered because it needs uh, to be applied to more than 12 million devices. A big thanks to Roy W. Nash and our community of viewers for submitting stories to us. If you found a new story you'd like to send, email it to newsroom at category5.tv. For all your tech news with a slight Linux bias, visit category5.tv newsroom at newsroom.category5.tv. For the Category 5 <laughs> TV newsroom, I'm Jeff Weston filling in for Sasha Dermatis. Thanks, Jeff. This is Category 5 Technology TV. Welcome to the show. Episode number 426 tonight. Mm. I'm Robbie. Shelly De Silva's here. Hello. Braden's on camera. We got Anthony here in the studio. Good to see you. I'm sure it's running through your head about that camera 
getting a virus infection. Anthony, of course, from froggy.ca, they do security. Mm -hmm. And uh, just the thought of plugging in a camera that's meant to protect mm -hmm. and getting a, a botnet worm, like Conficker. Ooh. That's a bad thing. And I think that because those are for, uh, you know, the, the, you, you, what would a jury think if your yeah. camera was infected with a virus? And chat room joking, oh, I didn't hit him. It was the virus. <laughs> 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 Thanks for that. Thanks for that. Yeah. Okay. Are we, uh, we can get straight back into this tonight. We're looking at uh, creating, generating longitude and latitude from yep. IP addresses mm -hmm. and from physical addresses using PHP. You can use this for all kinds of applications. We're looking at the very basics tonight. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure that you can think of uh, a variety of different ways that you could use this te technology and the techniques that we're learning. Mm -hmm. um, one way that I have used recently the, uh, the ability to convert addresses, physical okay. street addresses to longitude and latitude to place a pin on a Google map is uh, because I develop websites for real estate. Um, so I w work with the Canadian Real Estate Association mm -hmm. to build um, websites that are powered by their database to generate listings for uh, real, okay. real estate agents. And that goes to a map? And so that would typically, yeah, you would, you would expect that on your, mm -hmm. on your real estate listings that you would have a map to the, the home that you're interested in or whatever yeah. it is, a commercial property or uh, vacant land. Mm -hmm. And so the problem is, is that they don't actually provide, uh, if you're familiar with the DDF system or, or Canadian Real Estate Association, um, any of those kinds of things, MLS systems you probably have in your area, um, mm -hmm. they don't necessarily provide longitude and latitude. They only, they work from uh, physical addresses. So okay. there, there is no longitude and latitude provided by their database system. So we have to then say, okay, well, we'll take the address that you give us mm -hmm. for this real estate listing and create a map from it. But how do we do that without having to go through, uh, you know, expensive uh, API embed codes and uh, third party programs and things like that. We just want to be able to generate it once, mm -hmm. save it to a database and reuse it over and over again. And that's a key point too. Mm -hmm. These services, we looked at, um, at uh, for example, for the IP address lookup. I was looking at uh, freegeoip.net. Um, Google offers APIs for uh, Google Maps that allow you to geocode mm -hmm. in the opposite direction using either a address or uh, using okay. uh, reverse, look, uh, reverse from uh, longitude and latitude. But the problem is, is that, bo well, any of these services that are provided for free are going to have limitations. Uh, freegeoip.net gives you 10,000 queries per hour. Okay. Google, on the other hand, uh, and I should mention free, uh, freegeoip.net allows you to download the program and install it on your own server if you want unlimited queries, and it's still free. So they're, they're brilliant that way. Um, but Google limits you, I think it's 2,500 queries per day. And if you go over that, you have to pay or be cut off. And then it restarts the next day. So if you have, for yeah. example, a real estate listing website, here's okay. a good example, where I have a map that displays based on the address that the API has converted to longitude and latitude so that I could place a pin. Well, if I now have this website and it has 3,000 listings, mm -hmm. and then the Google bot itself or Bing bot or Yahoo bot or my own... Like resets? Well, no, if these bots for the search engines okay. go and spider your website mm -hmm. so they crawl through your website to index all of the pages mm -hmm. you've got 3,000 listings you've got a limit of only 2,500 queries per day so before the time before the, the point when Googlebot or Bingbot or whoever finishes indexing your site mm -hmm. you have now surpassed all of your queries for the day so oh. then when a real user goes to look at that listing it can't generate the geo coordinates based on address, and so you don't get a map. Or you get a map that's in the middle of the ocean because it, yeah. won't, it won't give you longitude and latitude. So how do we get around that? My point in that thread of thought is that we can run it as a cron, we can run it as a background process on the Linux server or whatever, and save it to a database and assign it to, in, in the real estate example, I would assign it to the, the listing ID, for example. So using a database for any of these services, you can then save it once because, hey, I know that your IP address 
is here, I don't need to look that up 10 times today just because you went to the website 10 times. I can save it to a database. I can set a cache so that it automatically rechecks after 24 hours or something just in case it changed for some reason. But generally speaking, if I've looked it up once, it's probably not going to change or at least not right away. All right, so mm -hmm. I hope that that, so we use a database to save it. We're not actually going to get into any databasing tonight, but we're going to get into uh, the code of how to actually make this happen. So Google, as I was saying, offers uh, some handy APIs that are free up to a threshold. Mm -hmm. uh, so we can use them without an API key. We can use them without having to do any kind of fancy fandangled code. Let's reverse. get in here. Mm -hmm. huh? No, I just said reverse coding. Yeah, we can do the reverse stuff, but what we're going to do is just look up by address. So I'm going to keep all this stuff, but I'm going to get rid of my printer, and we'll just kind of put that like that. So this time, we're going to look up by address. So let's say my address. Could we use Google's address? Uh, let's see if I have it written down here in my notes. Google's ad. Oh, I've got it from geolocation. Walcott Avenue. No, that was the one that, we, that oh. it came up as. It's like no, uh, Google's Google. actually address is 16, uh, actual address is 1600 uh, Amphitheater. Did I spell it right? Amphitheater, yes, Parkway. And that is in Sunny Cali. I'm losing my screen there. There we go. So let's just say that's the full address that I have. You can see I'm not going to pull that from someone's computer. If you're visiting my website, I need to be able to do a lookup. We're going to use the same kind of thing that we did before. Let's you know create a query for Google. Let's say query equals. And we're going to use Google's API. So this time we're going to do things a little bit different. We're going to... Uh, Is it supposed to say Mountain View? Oh, yeah. I missed a U. Thank you. Google may have figured that out because it is Google's API. So my query is going to go through <laughs> Google. We're going to go HTTPS colon maps dot. Don't worry, I'm going to have all of this available for you that you can actually download it and look it up. I'm doing it longhand so that you can see that this is, in fact, dead simple. You don't have to, you don't have to observe a whole lot of code or anything to figure this out. You'll see that I've only got like 10 lines of code already. So maps.googleapis.com slash maps slash API slash geocode slash XML. We could change that to JSON if we want, but we're going to do XML. Question mark address equals, and then we're going to go dot. See how I'm outside of the apostrophe there? So I'm doing this. I'm adding the address. So what we need to do is URL encode, which is a PHP function, dollar sign add address. Note how I spelt that. Okay. So it is going to add, uh, get rid of any spaces and things like that within that. So now if I output that query, just like we did before, just so that you can see what I'm actually creating here, let's run it. Mm -hmm. That's my big long query. So there it is. Okay. See how it added pluses and things like that? So let's copy that. Uh, let's add a, an end of line there. Whoop and then copy that to my clipboard and show you again how that's going to go. Okay, copy to clipboard and let's run that in my browser so that you can see the output. It says status is okay, so I got it right. <laughs> and there we go. So it is going to generate mm -hmm. latitude and longitude as well. So let's load this and you'll notice this one has a lot more details, doesn't it? Got yeah. latitude and longitude. Got, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it breaks it down into a lot more data. So yeah. let's open that up, and let's do the same thing that we did before. Let's load it with simple XML, which is a PHP function again. Where am I here? Sorry. There. Okay. So we're gonna go dollar sign, uh, and we'll call this one uh, Google's. Google API equals, and we're going to go at simple XML load file and dollar sign query because we've overwritten the original query with this one. So now if I go print our dollar sign Google API, let's run that code. And we're going to get that in PHP now as a simple XML object. Okay, so we've got an object called Google API, then we've got a simple XML object 
called result. Then we have address component, which is not an object. It's actually an array. And our first object, or our first uh, our, uh, key in the array is 0 and 1 and 2, and so it counts up like that. So what are we looking for? We need the longitude and latitude. Here it is here. So it's under geometry in the... Uh, I believe that was, yeah, that's in the object, the top level object. Then location is another object and lat long. Okay, it's within that. So let's see if we can pull all that data. Let's do it. So we're going to, uh, okay, dollar sign latitude. Bless you. All right. Bless you again. Oh. Google API. And I've got a printout here that is going to help me to remember how all this, uh, how this is structured. All right. So my Google API contains result. Geometry, and I said location, <laughs> and then lat. There we go. Let's see if that worked. So my latitude is what I'm trying to pull there from that. There we go. See that? 3, 7, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> I told you it might get geeky tonight. And I'm doing this in terminal completely in nano. Okay, lat, and then I've copied and pasted, and I'm going to change this to longitude, L-N-G. See that? Oh, yeah, you said uh, you were doing longhand. <laughs> yeah, long, well, I, I copied and pasted so that long. one last thing. Is that okay? <laughs> okay, so can I now, let's create an array from this. Your and fingers need a breather. G-O, lat. Okay, now I'm creating an array that contains lat and long. Okay, and now... Let's put them all to, all together and say echo dollar sign geo lat <laughs> comma. Oh, we have a question. Is this all standard PHP? This is all standard PHP. Now I've just created an object or uh, uh, an array that is called geo, and it contains latitude from the object. Okay, that's what we got from simple XML right here. Okay, remember I outputted that, and then I've got the longitude as well, which is pulled also from the geometry location portion of the, the object under LNG. So now I've created an echo that is going to output latitude, comma, longitude. That's what we need. Now let's, ah, it's hard when I'm zoomed in. Okay. No, I'm not inserting a file. <laughs> I don't know what I hit. Okay, <laughs> dot PHP end of line. Okay. Run it. There we go, latitude and longitude from address, okay? It's right on point. Now, let's see how on point that is. I'm going to copy that to my clipboard. Remember, we're doing this. Remember, Braden, we're doing this from under the hood, right? So I've converted an address now in PHP to longitude and latitude. So now when I do a search, I'm using latitude and longitude, not an address. Let's should, go to Google Should I Maps. do a drum roll? Do you, can you do a drum roll? That'd be kind of neat. Cool. Latitude, longitude. Hit enter. Where does it put us? Boom! Google Building 40 <laughs> at the Googleplex. I'm within three feet of the Googleplex. Three actually feet. on their roof. Yeah. So that is how insanely accurate so that is. Yeah. yeah, it's basically at the, at the front door. So you'll see, because, I, because of the way that's coded, even though it took some time to do this because I want to walk you through it and Flew explain by. it. Look at how simple the code is. That's it. That does two things. We've converted by IP address, and then it really, the address one starts here, and it's only a few lines of code to do it. Just a couple, eh? Right. So any address that you feed it now, so this could be uh, using my example of real estate. If I feed it a real estate address, and just make it dollar sign address and then run the query, I'm going to get the latitude and longitude for that. So now I can then save that latitude and longitude, which mm -hmm. I've pulled once, save it to a database so that okay. I never have to pull it again, or at least not for you know, a couple days maybe if that's what I want to use for a cache. 
Hmm. And it's that accurate. So where uh, IP address for Google put us about three and a half miles away from where they're actual si- actually situated, mm-hmm. using their physical address in PHP gave us an exact pinpoint on the, on the map. Okay. So it's incredibly accurate. So. To wrap it up, I'll tell you where you can get all the code. We're, we're okay. going to change the structure of our demo system a little bit, but demo.cat5.tv. Mm-hmm. Uh, we used to do incremental. Now we're going to start doing it by show episode number. I want to make it nice and simple for you to find. So ca- uh, demo.cat5.tv slash 426. That's right. tonight's episode number. Mm-hmm. That's going to give you all the code <coughs> that we looked at. Plus, I kind of broke it down a little bit further there for you so that you could understand um, some of the other options that are available to you, how it works. And it's okay. also well commented. You saw that. It's mm-hmm. like eight pages printed, uh, something mm-hmm. like that, to, to walk you through it. But the code itself, you could do this whole thing in three lines. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. So. Thanks, everybody. Hope you enjoyed that. Mm-hmm. Uh, enough of the geekery. Can we do some? Can I just sit back and we'll just do something? Yeah, just hang out. Yeah, can we just hang out? We have like one minute. Oh wow! We're so, almost done. Thanks, kids. everybody. This is Category Five Technology TV, and it's mm-hmm. so nice to have you here tonight. Oh, it's so good to be here. If we've helped you out uh, either in this show or the past shows, feel free to throw something in the tip jar. It'd be well used. Keep yeah, on definitely. Air. That's another thing. Yeah, mm-hmm. um, special thanks to everybody who's been doing their Christmas shopping through mm-hmm. our uh, partner links. You can go to um, yep. theshowshow.tv and click on partners, okay. and you'll see all of our links: Amazon, eBay, New Egg Canada, uh, bunch there. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can get shirts printed if you want to get a shirt printed for the kids that has mm-hmm. you know their name on it or you know yeah. whatever you want to do or something fun. Yeah. Um, you can do all that through our partner links. And people are doing that for their Christmas shopping. And oh, that neat. really yeah. is a cool way to support the show. Yep. And not just this show, but all of the programming that we offer here at Category 5, too. Yep. Thank you. Well, I guess that's, uh, that's it. Mm-hmm. I feel like I just talked and talked and talked. You did. Did you enjoy yourself, Jeff? <laughs> did you enjoy yourself? I did. Yeah. I did yeah. enjoy myself. Except okay. for a few teleprompter issues. <laughs> <laughs> Which you will never know even existed because they were already edited out. Yes. How do you like that, eh? Post-production for the win. That's good times. <laughs> good times. I just, I'm just i a little bit upset I'm not going to be getting a lightsaber for Christmas, though. That is oh. kind of upsetting. I was yeah. really kind of hopeful. I wanted to bring it to the... Uh, Leave it to the geeks, eh? I wanted to bring it to the December... You know, release of the new Star Wars movie. Nice. But not a good idea. Are we four no. weeks away? No weapons at theaters. That's just not a good it's idea. It's just two protons, side by side. <laughs> <laughs> Slice your like hand off. Yeah. Slice everything off of that. <laughs> well, it's been fun having you here. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Thank you to everyone here uh, for helping put on the show. Good to see you, Anthony. And uh, we'll see you again next Tuesday night. Quick mention, people have been saying, how can we get Sasha back on? Because uh, Sasha now works on Tuesday nights. Uh, mm-hmm. We've decided to take December 8th, uh, the Tuesday, December 8th episode. We're going to pre-record that the weekend prior. Okay. Um, so it will be a brand new episode, but it's going to be pre-recorded for you so that Sasha can be here uh, okay. because she's not able to be here on a Tuesday night live. Mm-hmm. So hopefully that's one way to, to get her onto the show that, uh, that you can appreciate uh, but we will be in the chat room that night. Mm-hmm. Uh, next week is, of course, live, and uh, we will be here same time as ever, Category5.tv. So thanks, everybody. Have a great week. We hope you enjoyed the show. Category 5 TV broadcasts live from Barrie, Ontario, Canada, every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Eastern. If you're watching this on demand or through cable TV, check out the local showtimes in your area at Category5.tv and find out when you can watch live and interact in the community chat room. Category 5 is a production of Prodigy Digital Solutions and is licensed under Creative Commons Attribution 2.5 Canada. We'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in.